Ten years ago, General Motors were fighting against a transition to electric transportation, yet recently they announced that they'll only be making electric cars. Ten years ago, jewellery company Pandora were fighting against lab-made diamonds, yet recently they announced that they'll only be making lab-made diamonds. The same thing is going to happen with animal agriculture. It's a trillion dollar industry with a trillion dollar problem and its days are numbered. Today I'm going to make a prediction that the world is going vegan. Now before I get into it, I first up want to say that I'm aware the word vegan is loaded and that this prediction might sound delusional. But there'll be an opportunity for Q&A at the end and I really welcome you to challenge any of the ideas that I put forward. But I really think by the end of this talk, there's a strong chance you could be convinced, like me, that the world is going vegan. Not because I think we're going to have some kind of ethical awakening, but because collectively we'll give up our systematic dependence on animal agriculture without even realising it. So right now you're probably thinking, what are you talking about? And to understand this, I want to explain my journey 10 years ago. You see, I actually went vegan without realising it. It started when I was experimenting on my diet and ditched animal products after realizing the longest lived cultures historically consumed a predominantly plant-based diet. But the key thing was, as I made the switch, I didn't even know what the word vegan meant. This is embarrassing, but I remember asking my dad, hey dad, what does vegan exactly mean? And he said to me, Klaus, I think you're pretty much vegan. You don't eat meat, you don't eat dairy, you don't have eggs, you've never liked fish. I think you're a vegan. And I started to think, not only had I stopped eating animal products initially for my health, I'd also stopped wearing leather and started to think differently. Without realizing it, I'd become a vegan. And my hypothesis is that collectively as a society, we will become vegan without realizing it. And once this happens, we'll truly start to understand the implications of our food choices and truly start to understand how many issues converge around the same choice of what we put into our mouths every single day. Because society just isn't doing this at the moment. We're not acknowledging the devastating consequences of animal agriculture. And this has really frustrated me over the years. Let me give you an example. Six years ago, I was listening to the radio and the radio presenter was talking about his two biggest concerns, climate change and obesity. These were the two most pressing issues that society needed to address, so he claimed. But what was really frustrating was there was literally no mention of meat or dairy. I was furious. I was like, I've never done this before, but I'm gonna call up. So I called up LBC, a big national radio station in the UK, for those of you that don't know. I waited and waited, and then eventually by some miracle, I got through to the producer. And before I knew it, they were actually putting me through to live national radio. So I knew that it was gonna be a competitive debate because it always is on this talk radio station. So I just went for it. I said, I completely share your concerns about obesity, but did he know that the things that a plant-based diet skips, such as cholesterol and saturated fat and animal protein, are actually implicated in the onset of not just obesity, but other comorbidities? I said, I completely share your concerns about climate change, but did he know that animal agriculture is the leading cause of not just greenhouse gas emissions, but also ocean dead zones and species extinction and rainforest destruction? And then there was silence. My one moment to share my knowledge and nothing. The radio presenter completely dismissed me. And before I knew it, I was off air, the commercial came on and that was that. You see, what you learn over time is that being vegan does not make you popular. I remember another story around the same time when I was having a barbecue with some friends and one of them saw that I was having a veggie burger. And he looked at me and said, I just don't know what's wrong with you, mate. Now that person, six years on, is lapping up this lifestyle because it's become socially acceptable. Doesn't that tell you something about society? Did he object to my choice of a veggie burger six years ago because of his principles? Maybe, but was it more that it was less socially acceptable at the time? Probably, and this is what it boils down to. And this may be one of the most important things that I've learned in over six years of doing this. Once you connect the dots between all the different industries and sectors, you realize there's a profound and irreversible shift away from animal agriculture that's already taking place. Now I could give you loads of uh, statistics. I could tell you that the number of Brits consuming plant-based alternatives has doubled in the last 10 years. And for example, Wagamum as many is now 50% vegan. I could tell you that Canada's food plate now excludes dairy as an essential component and 10% of Canadians are now vegan or vegetarian. I could tell you that the largest body of diet and nutrition professionals in the world now state that a vegan plant-based diet is healthy for all stages of life. 
But we get all of this. We get changes happening all around us when we see vegan adverts, menus, recipes, vegan food launches everywhere. But this isn't the reason that I think the world will go vegan because I'm so sure that the world is going vegan, but it's not because of this. Nor is it because the United Nations has stated that for us to avoid the worst effects of climate change and world hunger, the world needs to shift. Nor is it that COVID-19 has shone the spotlight on animal agriculture like never before, with a recent report showing that five of the seven most likely causes of the next pandemic are linked to animal agriculture. And finally, nor is it the fact that 80% of all antibiotics produced around the world are given to farmed animals to keep them alive, increasing the chances of antibiotic resistance, threatening us with the return of early 20th century healthcare, where infections that we currently view as trivial become deadly. The point is there are so many reasons the world needs to go vegan, but none of these are the main reason the world will go vegan. Because to be honest, many people know this stuff. Many people know that animal agriculture is a leading contributor to some of the biggest existential crises we're facing as a species and still buy animal products. I remember talking to my friend Pete, a really bright guy, always trying to do the right thing. I was talking to him about climate change and what we could do as individuals to make a difference. I told him about a study by the University of Oxford described as the most comprehensive of its kind. The study showed that for a typical average consumer, ditching meat and dairy is not just the single biggest way to reduce your greenhouse gas emissions, it's the single biggest way to reduce your impact on biodiversity, the nitrogen phosphorus pollution caused by your food, the land use and water use. Put simply, as the study author said, avoiding meat and dairy is probably the single biggest way to reduce your impact on the planet. And guess what? My friend Pete still buys animal products. Why is this? Is it because the University of Oxford isn't credible? Is it because he doesn't care or isn't compassionate? None of these things. What I've learned is that even though being vegan is such a simple lifestyle choice and definitely not extreme, we're social creatures and internalize ideas from our socialization. It's taken me over six years to understand this. That yes, awareness is important and has been responsible for many people changing their lifestyle, but I think the world will only go vegan en masse once we have a path out of something called cognitive dissonance. Now, many of us have heard of cognitive dissonance here today, I'm sure, but let me give you a quick example to really illuminate this issue for us. So when I was 18, before I was vegan, I worked in a hair salon in mainland China in a place called Daju. It was a bizarre experience, not only because I'd never worked in a hair salon before, but when I was taken out to dinner on the first night, I was offered vegetable skewers with either dog or pork. I obviously chose pork because the idea of eating dog, a dog, disgusted me. But why was I happy to eat one and love the other? Why was I happy to eat a pig but not a dog? Even though I was rational and I knew both had the capacity to suffer, I was so entrenched in my mindset. And this is what I learned. I didn't want to confront the moral hypocrisy of my beliefs because of cognitive dissonance, because of this meat paradox. Let me explain another way. Did you know that if you give someone a beef snack and ask them whether a cow feels pain, they're less likely to say yes than if you give them some nuts. There was a study done in this a few years ago. One group was given dried beef, the other group was given dried nuts. Both groups were asked a series of questions about animals and their capacity to suffer. The participants eating beef feed cows as significantly less deserving of moral concern compared to those eating nuts. Why was this? The questions hadn't changed, yet the responses had. Do people discount animal suffering because they subconsciously want to justify their habits? I don't know, but it's an interesting study. And what I do know is that when people aren't eating animal products, as I myself experienced, they're more likely to appreciate and admit the implications of their food choices. Now, there are other examples outside of meat. Let's take potatoes. We consider potatoes part of many national dishes here in the UK. But did you know when potatoes were first introduced to Europe in the late 16th century, they were met with widespread resistance? People actually thought they were poisonous and the church even claimed they were the devil's apple. Of course, over the years, potatoes have become a staple in the Western diet, partly because of government subsidies because they could be grown so easily. But it goes to show that once behavior changes, our perception changes. And this is a basic universal concept. Let's discuss the smoking ban. Now, how many of you in the audience remember the days we could go out and smoke wherever we wanted? Outdoors, indoors, even in pubs. Going out to a pub, you knew you were gonna come home, your clothes were gonna stink, even the next morning, because of the smell of smoke. But the freedom to smoke was considered a human right, a liberty that some enjoyed and others tolerated. So when the UK government tried to introduce a smoking ban in indoor spaces, 
people said that pubs would never be the same again. There was an outcry. And yet once it happened, people started to appreciate the benefits, including avoiding the stink and secondhand smoke. It's the same with congestion charges in busy cities. They were heavily criticised because people didn't like the uncertainty, the fear of change. Yet once behaviour changed, admittedly because it was a policy-driven change, society became open-minded, which once again shows that when behaviour changes, people are able to see the new habit in the context it deserves, including being able to see the benefits. Now, when the world goes vegan, I'll explain how this will happen in a minute, but when it happens, we won't just start to appreciate the benefits. We won't just start to appreciate the fact that we can get all of our nutrients from a plant-based diet and the fact that plant-based dieters are, for example, 73% less likely to suffer from moderate to severe COVID-19, a disease that ironically was caused by us exploiting animals in the first place. But we'll also look back and start to understand the horror of the atrocities that we are all participating in. Veganism will become more accessible, except it won't be called veganism, it will just be the new norm. Only then will we look back and think, how was it that we were able to provide adequate nutrition, water and healthcare to 78 billion land animals every year, while simultaneously struggling to provide the same treatment to 800 million humans who are undernourished? How was it that we decimated the ocean, the biggest carbon sink on the planet, by bottom trawling and industrial fishing? And how was it that we found it so normal to drink milk as an adult, and that too of a different species? But the real question is, what would it take for us to ask these questions in an unbiased way? What would it take for us to have some fresh perspective? How are we going to give up our systematic dependence on animal agriculture? And how are we going to overcome this meat paradox? And the answer is simpler than it seems, technology. You see, technological developments have driven dramatic shifts in diet all throughout history, including the invention of the plough, the rise of convenience foods, and many others. But in the last few years, we witnessed a really important innovation in our food system, the development of hyper-realistic alternative protein. Now, to understand why I'm certain that this will precipitate a worldwide shift away from industrial animal agriculture, I think it's really important to say that I'm not the only one making this prediction. Richard Branson has said the system will transition within three decades. And even Tyson Foods, one of the largest meat processing companies in the world, admit that the future of food will likely be meatless. This is what it's all about when you've got leading meat companies, and Tyson aren't the only ones, by the way, there are plenty of others saying, hey, we need to change. That's when you know that the world is changing. But how will this play out exactly? Well, the easiest way of explaining it is this. Today, the idea of eating meat and eating animals is synonymous. When we buy meat, our expectation is that an animal is being slaughtered for a bit of flesh on a plate. The process and the output are intrinsically linked. But what if these became separate concepts. What if we could go to the supermarket and buy all of the meat we want without breeding, confining, slaughtering animals? The person who illuminated this issue for me the most was Eric Schmidt. Who here has heard of uh, Eric Schmidt? Huge name in Silicon Valley, previously the executive director of Alphabet, Google's parent company. Now, as far as I'm aware, he's not vegan himself, but a few years ago, he said that vegan meat was the most important trend in tech. Now, he wasn't talking about passing off food like tofu for meat by chucking in some spices and flavours. That was the old school way. And let's be real, no surprise that these products didn't make a dent on the industry, because a lot of them tasted distinctly different to meat. But the trend we're seeing now is companies in Silicon Valley and around the world raising hundreds of millions of dollars, building plant-based alternatives up from the molecular level to mimic the taste and texture of real meat. And they're now partnering with massive fast food chains, including McDonald's, who've just released the new McPlant Burger, or Burger King, who've just launched Impossible Chicken Nuggets. And it doesn't end here, because there's another technology called precision fermentation, which, through fermenting microorganisms, has been shown to produce the exact same proteins in animal milk and cheese. British billionaire Jim Mellon recently came out saying he's certain the future will be free from traditional dairy, not just because of the unsustainable subsidies that artificially keep this industry profitable, but because of precision fermentation. And it goes one step further. Because I think we've all heard of lab-made meat or cultured meat, but who here actually knows how it works? In a nutshell, it involves putting animal cells in an incubator, allowing them to grow into muscle exactly as they would inside the animal's body, except outside of the body. The key thing is that this gives us the chance to produce real meat, cultivated meat, without the need for animal slaughter.
This might sound futuristic, but not only does Google co-founder Sergey Brin say this innovation could transform the world, but it's already happened with the launch of the world's first cultivated chicken nugget last year in Singapore, with many more products in the pipeline around the world that don't require antibiotics, don't require steroids, and most importantly, do not require slaughter. But here's the thing, this idea of meat without slaughter or dairy without milking or fish without fishing, you might be thinking it sounds like an interesting idea, but these companies are in the early growth stages, right? So will it be scalable or cost effective? Now to understand why I'm certain that economies of scale will be possible, we have to take a step back and look at the enormous economic inefficiencies of our current food system, particularly animal agriculture, which is completely unsustainable not just because of its contribution to climate change and health cleanup costs, but because for the vast majority of farms and meat and dairy companies, they simply would not be sustainable in the absence of government subsidies. We take for granted that subsidies are necessary for food security, but did you know in the US, animal agriculture is subsidized to the tune of $38 billion each year. By comparison, fruit and vegetables receive less than 1% of that amount. This has nothing to do with food security and everything to do with the power of meat and dairy lobby groups. Imagine if rather than artificially propping up animal agriculture, we redirected this money into the alternative protein space, which many lobby groups, including the Good Food Institute, are already pushing for, as well as the fastest growing ESG investor network, the FAIR initiative. And even if alternative protein is not subsidized, the beauty of this industry is that while the initial innovation and infrastructure will cost money, the running costs will be significantly lower than animal agriculture for obvious reasons. Think about it. Animal agriculture requires a huge amount of input, water, energy, and land, not just for the animals, but for the crops to feed the animals. Animals are incredibly inefficient converters of feed to food. Meat and dairy require a staggering 83% of farmland, despite producing just 18% of calories. This disparity does not exist in the alternative protein market, which is why even without subsidies, these products are just as cheap. And that's why investors are getting excited with cultivated meat receiving $350 million of funding in 2020 alone, up over 600% compared to the previous year. In the same way internet-based startups were all the craze in the 90s, even before internet usage was widespread, cultivated meat is receiving a huge amount of funding even before these products were available everywhere. But you might be thinking even if cultivated meat or any form of alternative protein for that matter, costs the same and tastes the same and is available to purchase at the same places, can we trust it? Now what's interesting about trust is it's slow but fickle. At first we resist the unknown, we don't trust it purely because it departs from the norm. But once we try it and new subconscious habits form, we act like it was normal all along. You see our brains are hardwired to see the future through the prism of our present. When I was growing up, I remember privacy being an inalienable right. We valued our privacy and loathed the idea of CCTV or sharing data online. And yet consider how fundamentally our attitudes have shifted. Today we accept our data floats around in the cloud, collected, analyzed and shared with third parties. Or take music over the last 20 years. In the early 2000s, the vast majority of people could not see themselves streaming music as opposed to owning it. Yet today, 77% of the music listened to in the US is done by streaming. The point is once change happens, we retrospectively think of the change behavior as normal and ordinary. And here's just one snippet of the change that we will see as normal and ordinary in the future. When you go to the supermarket, the aisle where you'll find your meat, your chicken, your pork mince, your bacon, it won't be the meat aisle, it'll be the protein aisle that in the short term will contain not just traditional meat, but also hyper-realistic plant-based and cultivated meat. Whole Foods started this trend in 2016 by placing the plant-based Beyond Burger in the meat case. Nobody reported at the time, but it was a pivotal event because it signified a shift in how we view these products. And more recently, major supermarkets, including Kroger in the US and Tesco in the UK, have started doing the same thing. Over time, traditional meat will be phased out of supermarkets as consumers not only won't be able to taste the difference between them, but for economic reasons, traditional meat will struggle to make the cut. And when this happens, I think we'll look back at what was involved in terms of the way we treated these animals, including the industry standard gestation crates, the tail docking, the castration, and the genetic manipulation, and think how could we have supported the system that we knew was so harmful? And also how could we justify it on the basis that it resembled a food chain? Because what we do to animals right now in 2021 
when we artificially impregnate them, when we take away their baby shortly after birth so we can take their milk, and when we kill them in windowless slaughterhouses has nothing to do with the food chain. For now, it's just a bacon and cheese sandwich, but when this is ended, as it will, because the world is transitioning whether you like it or not, I think we'll acknowledge the true scale of the injustice in the same way we currently look at other behaviors that we did in the past that we're appalled by. The point isn't that we're bad people. Most people do feel a deep connection of animals, but we end up making eating animals abstract by calling it meat and dairy, by wrapping it in a clean packet and by marketing it in the way we do, equating it to all kinds of ridiculous things such as masculinity, social status and family values. And this abstraction is the best way to hide the cruelty, the best way to lose the connection that we all have with animals and the best way to lose the connection that we all have with the planet. This has happened for so long, but it doesn't mean it has to stay this way. When I went vegan, it took me some time to see through the marketing ploys that I'd been unconsciously buying into for years. But once I did, I wanted to share it with everyone. It's what drove me to set up plant seeds. I wanted to raise awareness about the deleterious effects of animal agriculture and the fact that the American Dietetic Association and the British Dietetic Association, the two largest bodies of diet and nutrition professionals in both countries, respectively, categorically state that we don't need to buy into the system. We don't need to buy animal products for our health because a vegan plant-based diet, as they state, is nutritionally adequate and healthy for all stages of life, including pregnancy, lactation, childhood, infancy, adolescence, old age, and for athletes. And in fact, it goes beyond this because we now know that a plant-based diet cannot just prevent our leading killers in the West, some of which have affected my own personal family, but also reverse the progression of many of these same diseases. I made annual films about this and put out articles debunking the myth of regenerative meat, which is nowhere near scalable enough to mitigate against the impact of animal agriculture. More recently, I helped script the Netflix documentary Seaspiracy, which places the spotlight on how industrial fishing has decimated our ocean. And through all of these projects, I've realized that no one is too small to make a difference. As a philosopher famously said, our eyes can only see what our mind can understand. Our eyes can only see what our mind can understand. Raising awareness will always be the first step to social change. But what I've learned is that for awareness to translate into widespread, lasting social change, the power of unconscious behavior cannot be overstated. Take my mother-in-law who's Jane and believes passionately in hymns and non-violence to all sentient beings. But even after she learned the truth of the dairy industry, the exploitation of mother cows, the link between dairy and many types of cancer, she still used to have a morning tea with dairy. It wasn't until she discovered oat milk and realized it tasted just as good about any of the hormones, antibiotics, lactose or carcinogens that she made the switch. It's the same with meat. If you're in the habit of eating a piece of meat or fish with roast vegetables at the end of a long hard day, being aware that you're participating in an unsustainable industry may not be enough to change, but introduce an alternative protein, which is just as cheap with an indistinguishable taste and texture, then all of a sudden the effort that's required to make the change is minimal. Now I'm not saying we have to eat alternative protein, plant-based milk or vegan cheese for that matter, or that these products are necessarily healthy. We can thrive on a plant-based diet eating the foods our body was designed to eat, fruits, vegetables, nuts, and seeds just like gorillas who are anatomically so similar to us. Apart from eating a few insects, they're 100% herbivorous. But the reason I've mentioned alternative protein so much in this talk is because we got in ourselves into such a mess as a species that it's gonna be the only way for us to shift quickly enough away from animal agriculture. Because eating meat and dairy is such an ingrained habit. And this is a really important point because as a species, we want the option that doesn't make us feel like an outcast. People don't want to feel like me six years ago at that barbecue where I felt excluded and people asking what was wrong with me. In the future, this won't happen because alternative protein will be the norm. If we're at a barbecue and we automatically pick up cultivated meat or hyper-realistic plant-based meat without realizing it, it starts a new unconscious habit. So this isn't just a trend, but a transformation in our food system. And the really cool thing is it goes beyond our food system. Because as fewer and fewer animals are slaughtered, the industries that rely on animal agriculture's byproducts, such as fur and leather, will also be ripe for disruption. As is already happening with fashion houses such as Gucci and Versace ditching fur, and others releasing leather made from coffee grains, mushrooms, pineapple, cork, even kombucha. The market forces are simply so powerful that get this, already The Economist magazine has predicted that by 2040, 60% of the meat market will be made up of alternative protein. 
that means only 40% will be conventional slaughter-based meat in less than 20 years. And this is why so many corporations have announced ambitious targets to shift in the last year. Take Unilever, which has set a monthly plant-based sales target of 1 billion euros by 2027. Or Nestle, the largest food and beverage company in the world, which aims to release a plant protein to replace every single animal protein in the next few years. Even the Ministry of Health in China aims to cut meat consumption by 50% in the next few decades. And that's notwithstanding the exponential growth in meat consumption there, because they are seeing the unrelenting barrage of climate disasters that are happening and saying, hey, we need to change. So as we face more and more instability around the world because of the climate crisis and because of the prospect of antibiotic resistance, all of these things make veganism a less extreme option, a more viable solution and also necessary. So as we get to the end of this talk, I think it's really important to address the elephant in the room. If you're thinking what you're saying, Klaus, kind of makes sense, but I still don't think every individual on this planet is going to switch away from animal agriculture. I agree. That's not what I'm predicting either. Veganism is defined by the vegan society as a philosophy and way of living which seeks to exclude, as far as is possible and practicable, all forms of exploitation of and cruelty to animals. When I say the world will go vegan, what I'm saying is that by shifting away from animal agriculture on a global scale, we can and will see a world which excludes the exploitation of animals as far as is possible and practicable. The future I'm predicting is based on collective veganism, that is, veganism as a practical reality in a collective sense. Of course, agricultural reforms in developing countries will be slow, and in our lifetime, there'll still be factions of hunters, fishermen, and communities that farm animals, perhaps out of necessity. But remember the definition of veganism, the minimization to the highest extent practicable of all forms of animal suffering. If a subset of the population needs to farm animals, this is not necessarily at odds with the definition of veganism. The point is I'm talking about a global shift away from systematically breeding billions of animals into existence to be slaughtered, and the implications will be profound. Imagine if we were brought up without the moral hypocrisy that some animals are bred to be exploited while others to be cuddled and loved. Imagine if we were brought up to respect all forms of life and to prevent unnecessary suffering of all sentient beings. Do you think we would buy into the marketing labels that we hear such as free range, farm fresh or humane slaughter? Do you think we would find it morally permissible to take the life of an animal that wants to live, especially when we know we don't need to kill for our own health? And crucially, if we stop discriminating against other species based on arbitrary notions such as dogs are cute and pigs are tasty, do you think we would have the same propensity to discriminate against other humans based on equally arbitrary notions such as race and gender? Now, I know I'm going deep and getting passionate, and if you're reluctant to step outside your comfort zone, I understand. I used to be the same way. I used to think everything in moderation. But the beauty of what I'm describing is I'm not asking you to go vegan. I'm simply here to say that whether you like it or not, the world will go vegan. 10 years ago, General Motors were fighting against a transition to electric transportation. Yet recently, they announced that they'll only be making electric cars. 10 years ago, jewelry company Pandora were fighting against lab-made diamonds. Yet recently, they announced that they'll only be making lab-made diamonds. The same thing is gonna happen with animal agriculture. It's a trillion dollar industry with a trillion dollar problem and its days are numbered. Now, if you're a hardcore vegan, don't get too excited. This is gonna be a long transition. And if you're not a vegan, wait a few decades and you'll unknowingly transition. I went vegan without realizing it, but I stayed vegan after confronting myself with the following questions. At what point do I acknowledge that every meal presents me the opportunity to help shift away from such a cruel and unsustainable industry? At what point do I acknowledge that every meal presents me the opportunity to help evolve away from such a broken system? You see, if the unbiased and impartial information about the global implications of animal agriculture, that's out there, by the way, for all of us to look into, as well as the accessibility of plant-based food and alternative protein right now, at what point do we take responsibility for the shift that needs to happen and will inevitably happen? Because again, whether you like it or not, the world will go vegan. So the question I want to leave you with is, when you look back in 50 years time, what is the narrative that you'll be telling your grandchildren about the choices you'll be making today? Thank you very much. Thank you.